we're off. I'm absolutely delighted to formally welcome, at last after she's been listening to all the chatter, uh, our speaker for this evening, Florence Collier, more familiarly known as Flo. Um, <laughs> and that's been the source of one pun of mine tonight. Um, I did say that I hope the meeting would flow well. Um, <laughs> the, um, just make sure that I've got all participants muted. The um, Flo's experience is absolutely tremendous. Her qualifications are brilliant. She's a mechanical engineer. She's a passive house designer and a sustainability consultant. She has over 20 years um, experience in building design as a professional and as a chartered engineer. And um, she has been living in Wimslow, did you say Flo, 10 years now? Which is absolutely wonderful. Flo set up her own business in 2018 um, and it is known as Humblebee, which is a rather nice name. It has a warm sound and it's very appropriate. Humblebee has, I suppose you'd call it a company slogan or a pledge. And the pledge is to provide expertise in realizing healthy homes and workspaces whilst treading lightly on the planet and on your pocket. Wonderful aims. Linking into our topic tonight, the home of 2030 competition was born out of the government's ambition to meet the grand challenges of our age helping the country to adapt to ageing society whilst fighting climate change and boldly pursuing our 2050 net zero commitments. And what an appropriate time for Flo to be talking to us uh, whilst the COP26 um, conference is in progress. The home of 2030 design competition attracted the best and the brightest talents in the housing industry. Uh, uh, the, those talents are in, or were invited to design the homes of the future. Small businesses, designers and manufacturers were invited to come forward with ideas of low carbon, age friendly homes and meeting the high standards of design. As part of a collaborative team, Humblebee, um, with challenging per perpendicular architecture, forms the Positive Collective working on their own entry for the home of 2030. I don't want to steal too much of, of uh, Flo's talk later on, so I'll just hear a little bit more. Um, the home of 2030 competition was really challenging and Flo's team were one of the six finalists that took their design to a very significant level of detail. Indeed, proving to us that our speaker tonight is, and I can confer, one of the best and brightest in her profession. So I'm absolutely delighted, Flo, if you now unmute yourself, you can share your screen when you're ready, and it's over to you. Thank you ever so much, um, Stuart. I hope you can all hear me um, and appreciate the rock star background i'm in my brother-in-law's uh, home office at the moment and uh, he's got me all set up with the light and the mic so <laughs> and the guitar um so here we go i'm going to share my screen um and i think it will be this screen here um can you see that Excellent, yeah. Great stuff. So thanks for the introduction, Stuart. That was, uh, I won't dwell too much on myself uh, after all that. <laughs> but yes, I've, uh, we've lived in Wilmsley now 10 years. So, um, and Humblebee's been in existence uh, three years. Um, we entered uh, a competition with change building and perpendicular architecture um, just before the first lockdown. Um, and out of that came a uh, positive house. And because we got through to the second stage, we decided possibly we were onto something and um, formed the positive collective uh, to try and take these things forward uh, a bit further. Um, one of the things I do most of in my work, day to day work is retrofit. Um, and I won't dwell 
too much on this, obviously, uh, but retrofits of existing building stock is really our, uh, our biggest challenge, even if it's uh, messy and unattractive work, uh, because we're talking about insulation and air tightness and ventilation, which even if you are a building engineer, you won't necessarily get too excited about. Um, yet 80% of the buildings we'll have in 2050 are already built, so really um, that should be our, our priority. Um, having said that, that's a completely different talk. So tonight I'll be showing you that uh, while, we're, while we're still building new, um, there are ways of making uh, a positive impact and the solutions are achievable now. So here's a whirlwind tour of Positive House and the Positive Community. Um, it might get a little bit technical uh, at times, so I apologize for that, um, but do post your questions in the chat and uh, they'll get fielded um, at the end. Um, and uh, this is what I think you should expect of new build housing, even if it means um, dragging some people, uh, possibly some developers kicking and screaming into our current reality. Um, and by that, I mean um, some of the crises we're facing, such as climate breakdown, um, social inequality and um, severe biodiversity loss. Um, but um, hopefully you've enjoyed the Festival of Nature so far and uh, we are tr really trying to communicate um, our, our unending uh, positivity and messages of hope. So um, here we go. Um, just to give a bit of context, I think actually Stuart mentioned um, most of this in his introduction. Uh, it was in fact, we, uh, we believe it was um, Esther McVeigh's original idea to launch a competition uh, when she was uh, Minister for Housing and Communi Communities. Um, and as the Positive Collective, we, we went through um, to the second stage um, as one of six, six groups, setting out how housing can meet the new expectations of uh, net zero carbon, uh, better health and well-being, uh, age inclusivity, all within a deliverable and scalable framework. Um, Off-site manufacture or modern methods of construction uh, were considered to be an essential part of the solution. So we got together for this exercise just before the first lockdown and uh, but we were already communicating uh, with each other remotely because we were in different parts of the country so Adrian was in Surrey and Patrick was in Cambridge um, and then the tools just all came online uh, at that uh, that time for us to um, to collaborate uh, in this way um, and it's lovely to see so many people today and, and some some faces uh, that I recognize as well which is great um, so it was a real collaborative effort, not a, it wasn't an architectural competition with other disciplines bolted on or siloed. Um, we each brought everything we knew to the table week after week and uh, bringing in other experts as needed. Um, so working in sustainability over the years, we've been at different stages of this chart with our offerings in the built environment. Uh, we might have even set some project ambitions in the restorative or at least the sustainable design camps on this graph um, initially, but inevitably projects revert to um, doing what we know, uh, usually what the budget can stretch to without reprioritization. And we end up um, sort of missing the mark sometimes, uh, thinking we'll do, we'll do better next time. Um, most volume house builders, on the other hand, have no interest uh, or very little interest in doing anything more than what's required by law. Uh, they can dismiss some of the planning requirements for increased performance over and above building regulations by just providing a statement to say it's un unviable. And um, generally that's unsubstantiated and then they're not really pushed for anything, anything more. So this means that new builds have generally had a degenerative impacts on our environment. So, uh, uh, and it also means that the planning system and our local plan has to grow um, a little bit more teeth in that regard. 
So as a group, uh, we quickly came to get to the conclusion that um, any solutions for the future would absolutely have to do more than just repair the decades of, um, of damage that we've done. And finally, we focused on the idea of regenerative de design, which you might hear in some circles um, of architecture and uh, the construction industry. In other words, um, we felt the need to move beyond the current notion of sustainability, um, which is a static assessment tool um, and not just limit the impacts or even restore those impacts, but um, have a positive impact on our built environment. Such uh, complex challenges, they need systems-based responses. Um, and as engineers, we're well used to thinking along those terms. Our ambition was not just to design a home, but to identify a process that would lead to wider national benefits. Um, and there are many features of this in the final design, but the obvious one was the avoidance of extractive materials that are detrimental to biodiversity and resource um, supply, and therefore the use mainly of wood um, in, the, in the actual design. So bio-based materials uh, linked to what we call des design for manufacture and assembly and disassembly now uh, maintains that material value over its uh, first use life and it looks to enable remaking and remanufacture of buildings in the future which is what this diagram tries to show in a sort of um, spirally kind of way. So, um, the use of mass timber in buildings made total sense to us um, as a regenerative ingredient uh, it does mean planting more trees and at a faster rate than we currently do. Um, and there will be no doubt uh, lots of debates about how best to do that. What we don't want is to end up with a monoculture forest um, that's devoid of biodiversity, for example. But starting from the premise that we can um, naturally replace these products and increase the forest cover in the country, uh, it was a core part of our circular economy thinking. And if you haven't read it, it's already an excellent book is Donut Economics by Kate Rayworth, um, which apparently I'm told was summarized by a young character in the Stenders recently. So there you go. <laughs> We're hitting the, uh, the big, the mainstream. Um, circular economy principles are also emerging as part of corporate ambitions uh, for a more progressive sustainability agenda in many companies. And like these, mega trends we can expect more on this uh, especially as we understand the wider ecological and health and well-being issues that we face so this was our uh, general approach to the master plan starting with landscape um, we would um, we would identify uh, sort of the the typical habitats and biodiversity locally, uh, what's endemic, um, and find opportunities to um, enhance that, uh, that local biodiversity. And we'd, our second stage of the competition was actually a site near Nottingham, so this is where some of these um, uh, species uh, will, have, um, will have come about. Uh, but we'd, we'd, expect, we'd expect any site uh, with a significant number of, of houses um, to start from, from this, uh, this point. Uh, in other words, putting the landscape at the core uh, to achieve a, a net biodiversity gain and enhance the, the natural environment. Um, and regardless of the site, this is the way we should be approaching the master plan. Um, looking at this from the bottom up, uh, so typically we, we'd be driven by the quantity of units and, and not necessarily the quality of homes, but here we started by reconnecting with nature, so this was the first, um, the first layer of the master plan. Um, then we would, and this is about identifying and protecting and rehabilitating um, local species and stitching the various networks that we call um, on top of that, as a second layer, all the networks, so the, the infrastructure, which we call blue, gray, uh, blue green and gray, uh, being water and, um, 
uh, green, well, green uh, <laughs> is self-explanatory, and then the hard and soft infrastructure for circulation, connecting um, people with their with their nodes of transport. Um, and then on top of that layer comes the opportunity for um, communal spaces, engaging the the residents. Uh, and providing moments of socialization within the uh, within the actual site um, and we wanted to give a flavor of what was possible while providing uh, flexibility and um, allowing the, the community itself to take ownership of the space between their houses So just dropping back a, a second to um, our town in Wilmslow and speaking of engaging with uh, the community, these are uh, some of the Wilmslow's uh, children's artwork for their vision of our town in 2030. Um, and it's, it's quite striking what you might notice, taking a look around. Um, I didn't spot a single car in this, uh, uh, in this selection and there's obviously lots of lots of green around which is great to see and renewable energy obviously um, so community was at the core of putting the positive house into its context um, it takes a village to raise a child and it's not just a saying um, we felt it was a fundamental tenet of a well-functioning society and it works both ways um, there's so much anxiety among young people at the moment, and you might be able to um, trace that back to the fact that we've tried to break away from the village and the community way of life with small nuclear families trying to do it all for themselves and really probably struggling, even if on the outside or on social media, it doesn't necessarily show. Um, but that intergenerational interaction is, is key for delaying ageing in older people, um, that's been widely researched and children lose the benefit of a, a watchful eye and, and the wisdom of the, the community around them. Um, by constantly trying to keep children away from the elderly, I think we miss, we all miss out as a society. So um, it meant a lot of us, um, it meant a lot to, to us uh, to bring those, those things together into um, into our master plan because otherwise we have to end up we, we end up campaigning pitting groups of sort of our society against each other because of the passion involved so um, the campaigns like 2020 or playing out this is a, this is a an example of closing the streets for the children to um, have a play on the street safely um, say on a Sunday um, but we wanted to bring that into um, just sort of day-to-day -day life really. So anyway, co uh, community aspects and keeping spaces free of motor vehicles then was really important to our master plan and, and also addressing the age inclusivity aspect of the, of the competition. We started our design journey with concepts of permeability um, and walkability and then bring nature and biodiversity within the community as the green lungs of the site. Um, so you can see those pockets of, of green everywhere whilst creating some flexible social spaces and just you know opportunities for interaction which you you can partake of or not um, as it were so uh, and through identifying who will be living in the community you, you can understand their needs place the green and blue and social infrastructures around them to ensure they're easily accessible um, images of our Village Square was just a suggestion of what might be possible, um, just to give. Um, but you know, uh, the actual community can can be can come together and um, and be consulted. Uh, and so the 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 concept and the approach is is flexible enough for that um, adaptation. We wanted to encourage behaviours that have a real effect on the environments environment's ability to recover and reduce consumption. Uh, so this kind of environment also gives us the opportunity to lead healthier lives, both physically and emotionally. Um, we've created opportunities to meet and check in on each other, bringing the outside in, um, 
and vice versa, reconnecting to nature, reconnecting to food growing and to each other. Uh, you might be able to spot the allotments at the top there and some urban farming space uh, for growing and harvesting and eating together because food is often the catalyst for social cohesion. Um, we included a sharing and repair centre, so that's an opportunity to reconnect over exchanging and repairing goods and clothes and playing games and very much uh, inspired by our transition ones activities. Um, and then you'll notice that all the, the uh, vehicles are electric, um, but they're also confined to the periphery. Um, and the idea is that, for example, uh, deliveries could be dropped off at the, at the sharing centre for easy um, collection, which leaves the space between the houses free of car and, and traffic noise, um, while allowing you know, emergency access in, in any case. So there's, there's still that that infrastructure um, when it's needed. This uh, gives us the context. So now um, onto the house design. Uh, with Positive House, we wanted to make a positive impact, uh, as, as we said before, and use, um, we decided on the, on the use of cross laminated timber or CLT for short. Uh, specifically, it uses a CLT balloon frame which means the walls of the structure as opposed to a stick frame and infill panel construction. Uh, we felt this was a neat way to get better air tightness, um, a more solid feeling uh, structure and faster build times. It was very noticeable in both the responses to our stage one pr proposal and in other comments we received um, about how interested people were in delivering um, homegrown cross laminated timber. Uh, I think people understood how this is closely linked to future reforestation and getting the right type of tree in the right place and for the right reasons. Um, after all, the UK used to be covered in forests and, this, and that's severely depleted, even in respect of um, our European counterparts. Um, and you can see how we could potentially uh, increase the, the tree cover here and we we did this by um well the idea was to change uh the demand side criteria um so using uk specific uh timber grades um at the moment for buildings we use grades that are sort of c20 and, and upwards um for building design um but if we if we can use, if we can find a way to use six C16 plus timber grades, uh, which we have, or we feel we have, um, and actually there's some built um, examples around the country already, um, then we can consider the species that we can grow here on, on our um, on our territory. So uh, we collaborated with experts from Edinburgh University and a small, some small scale manufacturers in Scotland that are leading in this development um, of this. And Wales have a, have a great plan for, um, for using wood in construction in the near future. Um, this just shows some of the, um, the basic components of positive house and how they they might be assembled um, and how they've developed from a simple concept and they will go through to um, full full design um, but instead of going for a full off-site manufacture in a purpose-built factory uh, which is often referred to as a vertical model of delivery uh, which requires high upfront investment in the factory building and the machinery, we've opted for what we've called the distributed model, which I'll go on to uh, explain. Um, um, so the, distrib the distributed model means uh, that the component tree is assembled by suppliers who are already digitally enabled. Um, in other words, they're already able to produce these products using component information in a digital format, um, which can be traced and brought to site. Um, and they can be assembled nearby before being brought to their final uh, location or plot. Um, 
This allows for many uh, different scales of use and more local skills inclusion, um, as opposed to only employing the construction workers where the factory is located. It also means safer construction, including COVID safe, safe spaces now. And by identifying the components of the design and the needs of manufacturers, um, we can generate design that suits the flexibility of their manufacturing, not just thinking everything has to be overly standardized. Uh, so this is the sort of flying factory concept that we developed, developed for the Positive House as part of this distributed model, model. It puts the factory on or near the site uh, and uses the coordination advantages of a digital twin uh, to let suppliers manufacture and supply components to suit and then pre-assemble these before final installation on site. Timber in this case allows most jobs to be undertaken with simple hand tools. Um, this is how we thought to reduce the, the capital investment of the offsite factory. Um, and this can be a temporary facility on site or even in a nearby rented space. So for our particular test sites, at say 100 units a year, uh, which is double the current average rate, we reckoned you would need about 30 full-time employees for the factory locally um, and others on site for the assembly. Of course, you can do this in a remote facility uh, if there is enough volume to, um, to justify the investment, but we wanted to make sure that our approach was accessible to as many different builders as possible, including uh, small to medium enterprises. We described the approach as being panels um, the 2D wall and floor elements that are pre-fitted uh, with finishes and services and chunks that are the services modules uh, with normally high on-site labour requirements that have been grouped together to allow them to be pre-assembled, pre-commissioned and tested and then just connected on site. The benefit of the flying factory and this approach is that it can include local skills and opportunities for employment and training. Um, connected to the communities where the building is taking place. Uh, this is just a small diagram to show how the building services, for example, are integrated into the structure. Um, we've kept simple servicing uh, concepts and distribution in floor cassettes with uh, risers, which are the bits, the vertical bits that connect the floors. Uh, and modules that slot into the construction. Which um, moves, uh, which brings us on to the servicing requirements of the house. Um, and I'll, I'll only be talking about heating and ventilation, but those are the main things uh, we'll need. So we've designed um, all the different building types on the site to meet the passive house standard as a and we call this a fabric first approach, which is looking at the, the whole at the envelope uh, in particular. Um, with the luxury of a new build site, two of the main pillars of Passive House are pretty much um, at, our disposal, at our disposal. So form and orientation. So a simple form uh, with not too many ins and outs is much more efficient um, and at keeping heat in, I mean. And um, then orientation we can optimize to, um, to benefit from the sun, for example. Um, and then the other principles that need addressing are the installation, uh, which includes windows and uh, looking after thermal bridging or trying to eliminate them as far as possible. Uh, air tightness is, is one of the, the most important factors in. Um, in a passive house, which doesn't mean you can't open the windows. In fact, you need to open the windows. Um, it just means that when they're closed, uh, we have very limited leaky leakiness. Um, and because of that, um, we would need uh, to provide adequate ventilation um, at, at a constant rate. Um, but we do this with heat recovery. So that's what this diagram shows. Um, taking outdoor air in through the machine, which uh, exchanges heat with indoor air, which is already at room temperature, 
Um, so you're supplying air from outside at near, near room temperature in effect. And it's all fresh and fr um, filtered. Um, and just the right amount. <laughs> um, this is our, this was the original sketch in our first, um, in our first round of submission uh, of the semi-detached, for example. Um, we also devised a townhouse and an apartment block design, which was even more efficient in terms of form um, and therefore contributed more towards a carbon positive development. To help achieve the passive house standard in all house types, we have the balloon frame structure where the wall panels are continuous across, across the floor levels. Um, this means they can be installed quicker, there are fewer joints, and we have larger external panels. Um, and all you need to do then on site is zip, zip them up uh, to give us our air tightness. Um, we have the thick wraparound insulation layer, just like a coat. This reduces our heat losses, including um, avoiding cold bridging. The, the ground floor is a raft with um, concrete that uses a higher cement replacement percentage, uh, which reduces its embodied carbon and it avoids downstands to make the detailing simple. So it's a, um, basically a, an insulation, um, insulation formwork on, on which you um, pour the, the concrete. Um, we've gone for a very simple form, as you can see, uh, that's again to avoid excessive heat loss area and uh, we have triple glazing which keeps surface temperatures high and improves acoustic comfort and um, all these so we still have uh, lighting and power demands within the, the house and uh, as you'll see some of the, the heating is is done electrically so in order to make this a, a positive um, a positive house in terms of energy we've got uh, both solar solar thermal for our hot water and these um, uh, pv panels that generate more um, more electricity than we consume well that's the prediction so um, the result is a very low or even no heating or energy bills with the benefits of allowing everyone including at risk and vulnerable people to be more comfortable um, in winter and in some cases, in cases lifting them out of, of fuel po poverty. As it's a timber building, we felt um, we, we, should, we included a, a misting sprinkler system throughout. Um, and the occupants, as we said, benefit from uh, constant fresh air and heat recovery. Um, and you can see the sort of servicing module at the bottom here, which just slots in. Um, on an external wall somewhere. Um, so effective ventilation for indoor air quality was found to be even more important, especially in, in the times of the pandemic. Um, and then finally, we've assessed uh, the overheating risk of just background ventilation, although opening windows is a big part of having a connection to outside. Um, and really, we're dealing with that risk by providing uh, appropriate shading, and this will be different from in different orientations. So a passive house isn't completely devoid of um, heating demand, as we said, in our climate. Um, so there's still a decision to make about how to deliver that heat. Um, so having got the demand down to say a kilowatt or so, one and a half kilowatts, or the semi-detached, what were our um, low carbon choices? Um, so this graph just shows uh, a comparison. All, all these lines are for a, a passive house, so um, one that achieves 15 kilowatt hours per square meter per year. Um, and the top orange line is direct, is um, heating through direct electric heating. So that's just electric radiators or uh, an electric uh, element in, in the air system. And the uh, flat line, it would be the gas one because the, the emissions from the gas are, are constant um, throughout the years. 
Um, and that middle point is 2020. So anything to the left of that is, is historical. Um, the rest is a prediction, so um, it could be completely wrong, <laughs> but this is what we would need to do um, in, to meet our, uh, our current um, ambitions. So as you can see, the, ele the electric um, comes right down compared with, with gas. And then you've got uh, various sort of heat pump um, uh, heat pump solutions, um, which are probably a little bit conservative here. They could be even even lower than that. But by the time you get to sort of 2030 and 2040, um, they all pretty much converge. So as we were looking for a 2030 house, <laughs> we, we felt quite comfortable with um, our positive house, which at that time um, actually only needed seven uh, seven kilowatt hours um, per square meter, so it was it was roughly half um, the direct uh, the the normal passive house. Um, so yeah, so it made everything a lot simpler um, to go down that route, um, and that's what we chose. Um, Extending the idea of uh, carbon over the lifetime of building, um, we also looked at the value of the temporary store of carbon in the timber itself, in the timber of the building. Um, so this was a study that we did as part of the, the project, uh, looking to go beyond net zero to a carbon positive um, uh, proposition, as it were. So the positive part is actually below the line in this case. <laughs> um, but the top, the, the graph uh, in the sort of red and orange shows you what a typical um, house design would need. And you've got a, a steep uh, embodied carbon impact at the start of the construction. Um, and then you've got your operational um, emissions. So it's just all up, up, up um, in that case, whereas, um, our concept was to, to bring that below the line um, from day one, really, and also um, generate um, more energy than we consume, therefore uh, avoiding uh, carbon emissions in the long term. Uh, the little blips are just the sort of um, um, replacement and upgrades that you would do to a house. Um, normally, but by having a very lean design and design for both durability and adaptability, adaptability we uh, were able to avoid some of those extra material impacts. Um, so yeah, so since then we've actually updated our calculations um, using um, sort of a more standardised methodology, um, although it's all in a bit of flux and, and the industry is trying to um, uh, align targets and uh, methodologies. So these are just different ways of expressing um, both the embodied carbon and the operational uh, carbon of the building over time. Um, 60 years is a reference period. We would, um, we would hope that the house would actually last a lot longer than that. So whether, um, if you look at the, the right-hand graph, um, sorry, engineers love graphs, so um, I'm, I've had to introduce a few. <laughs> um, the the right-hand graph shows how we are um, negative in terms of um, our, uh, our emissions at the start, or positive in our world. Um, and then as you uh, replace various bits of equipment, it goes um, a little bit above the line. Um, and that's for the semi itself, um, but it could be a lot more efficient in, in other typologies. Um, and then the, the steep um, the steep hockey stick at the end is basically all the emissions from the carbon store exiting the boundaries of, of the calculation. So um, it could be that um, it's all incinerated, which is what the RICS uh, methodology um, generally assumes, uh, but that would be a, pr a pretty poor use of the of the timber um, at, at the end of its life because you can actually reuse these um, elements or 
uh, recycle them into other building products and extend the life of those. So yeah, so just trying to put numbers to what we do. Um, in terms of the architecture, um, we, as, I think I mentioned at the beginning, our site was in Nottingham. Um, so, but we would assess the sort of vernac local vernacular, um, and because it's it's a, a flexible system, we could actually, you know, we can choose the the materials to suit uh, the locality, um, and also planning. Um, planning restrictions if there are any um, so and customization was um, was a big part of the of the design so you uh, because it's pan is panelized um, you can actually have a variety of, of window sizes uh, just keeping to certain um, manufacturing rules um, and then different um, expressions uh, externally um, as well as internally. Um, and when we uh, decided on the size of the house, um, we were keen to make it a proper house with no need to extend. Um, it's quite funny here in Wilmslow, um, we just love to extend and uh, <laughs> um, a friend walking around remarked that all the houses looked like they'd been pumped with steroids because <laughs> they'd each sort of grown um, significantly on all, on all parts. Um, but if we start with uh, floor plans and um, enough space uh, so these space standards are more in line with average European space standards, uh, so a little bit more generous than our, our national ones, uh, minimum ones. Um, then we can build in some flexibility and adaptability and just uh, flicking through some of the options um, as the family uh, has dif differing needs as they go through. Um, you can reconfigure the space, put in a lift. Um, um, yeah, have that extra bedroom or home office, as it were. Um, and similarly, um, these are just some of the shots of the interiors that show um, how we try to get the, the inside out. Uh, the, the outside in, sorry, um, and even growing inside. Um, and that lovely exposed CLT uh, as a finish. Um, and the flexible office space come homeschooling space, <laughs> if ever we were to need it. Um, but also um, some generous uh, proportions. So it feels um, feels uh, like home, and this is where I will end the main part of the talk. Hopefully, we've done all right for time. Thank you so much, Flo. That's been absolutely wonderful. <laughs> <laughs> it's uh, been an eye opener. And I will be coming back to you for some more detailed yes. information. <laughs> yes, um, it was a bit. But it's difficult to get those uh, technical points across succinctly, but hopefully with the Q and A we can uh, um, we can unpack some of that. <laughs> so on that note, I'm going to hand over to Pippa. <laughs> You'll have to unmute yourself, Pippa. Oh, hello. There we are. Um, thank you so much, Flo. That was that was amazing. You know, having, having heard about what you've been doing, I obviously had had no real idea what it what it all was. And it, <laughs> it just sounds incredible. So um, and such a lovely talk. So thank you very much. We've got <coughs> a question from Helen Battelaz here. Helen, do you want to do you want to ask your question directly? If you unmute yourself, is she there, Helen? What she's saying is, do you have any comments about the proposed development on Lindo Moss? 
These are described by the house builders as eco houses. What additional eco features could realistically be expected in them? That's a really good question with Helen. Sorry. Uh, I'm my of course. Um, I remember seeing the uh, posters that were up quite um, early on in the consultation. Um, <clears throat> I haven't actually had a chance to go back and revisit what they're proposing uh, because we've been focused a lot on the um, restoration of the moss as part of the planning condition um, more than anything. But um, And at the time they were talking about code for sustainable, sustainable homes. Um, and it's a real shame that that's been scrapped because actually that was a relatively <coughs> good tool for um, assessing homes, but we we might need to um, to go back to that. Um, some of the features I would expect are um, in terms of energy, at least the passive house standard, um, so that the actual um, object that you're building has the least demand on resources really in terms of heating and, and ventilating um, and then there, there should really be um, some form of generation on site um, and I think in the next decade certainly heat pumps would be the better uh, the better solution uh, it makes a lot of sense um, it's technology that we know um, and it's relatively, you know, if it's designed well, it's relatively simple to, to operate. Um, so, and it's also closer to what we're used to in terms of, of the, the type of heat that we're, we're delivering. It's just at a lower temperature. But to be, fr to be honest, a lot of people who, who are in a passive house say they hardly have the, <coughs> excuse me, the heating on um, and the children are, running around in um, shorts and t-shirts most most of the time without the heating on so there you go <laughs> it's, that's my kind of house <laughs> so um uh, if anybody wants to have a look the the, the uh, revised planning application came in uh, just a year ago um and it's on the cheshire east uh, planning website and it's still not been agreed uh, but there was a lot of talk about them that, that they're they're asking for to build bigger houses because they said that the um, uh, the energy generation would take up more space but they didn't really give any any um, uh, detail about that and uh, they're talking about heat pumps and other things but there was there was very little detail and I think probably it's quite easy to call something an eco home isn't it when there's there's an awful lot of that going around I have to say mm. yeah mm. yeah okay so we've got another question from Ian Porter about green spaces Ian did you want to ask your question directly if you okay. unmute yourself <clears throat> i think um the settings might be that you as host need to unmute people okay um oh okay i've just managed to find my picture <laughs> <laughs> so i've unmuted oh, yeah. um, i was very interested to see your uh, sort of village diagram at the beginning of your presentation and uh, you had a lot of green spaces in it, but uh, um, I, I believe it's true to say that as well as, well as green spaces, you need to have green corridors to enable the biodiversity you're trying to, uh, to, try to um, attract uh, to Coach move around. Yes. Yeah. Oh yeah, absolutely. So the green infrastructure was, um, uh, it was part of, um, Part of that was to link the places with uh, with planting, um, and I could, I even wanted people's hedges to be sort of fruit trees so people could just eat their way to <laughs> across the site. <laughs> Not fruit trees, but you know, fruit bushes like uh, raspberries and black currants and things like that. Um, so that would that would have been my my um, my take on it. But at the end of the so at the end of the day. We wanted it flexible enough that people could, um, you know, take ownership and 
um, and you know the type of that's a bit of an unknown is how people might actually manage the space but um, there are all sorts of models that um, we envisaged including you know self-build or co-housing community communities or um, where they have some kind of consensus about how to manage um, their own um, space um, but yes, green green infrastructure absolutely. I think it creates shade. It creates um, like a microclimate, so that in summer it's um, it's much more pleasant. Um, and also, it means the air that's coming into the houses is cooler. That kind of thing. It's is you know green is is definitely uh, uh, an important part of of rehabilitating our our spaces. And making them more attractive to walkers and cyclists, obviously. <laughs> and Ian, you had a second question about insulating material. Yeah. Oh, um, yes. I was wondering what, uh, very interesting to see the, the plans for building the houses. You didn't specify what kind of material. I you didn't. Were. You're right. I did have it in my notes and I skipped over it. <laughs> Sorry. It was uh, it's wood fibre in this particular case. Um, so again, um, based on a sort of timber supply chain uh, that's properly managed, um, but also um, I think if you were to take the whole tree and the different parts of the tree, um, thinking about how they can all contribute to um, to the design of the house is really important. It also is quite a dense material, it can be very dense. Uh, so it gives some thermal inertia to the building, which also helps with, um, with, um, with a summer overheating, for example. Um, yeah. Would you, would you consider wool? So, yes, um, I think, well, we are working with a, another developer actually at the moment, a small developer in, in Yorkshire, um, and we'll be considering all those different alternatives. Um, the issue with wool, well, I think there's a good, there's a very big plus to wool in that we've got lots of sheep in this country. <laughs> um, the only downside is the processing of it. I think there's a lot of stripping of, um, uh, stripping of the, the oils and things to make it appropriate as a insulation material but um definitely i would recommend anything like that um yeah Thank you. oh, you're welcome did you have another question ian or no, we... okay <laughs> uh, vince had a question vince chadwick had a question has a question about the flying factory oh yes yeah um i, I like the idea of it um as having a... the local the, the, you know the local uh, location getting local presumably you get local tradespeople involved with it and things like Correct. that yeah 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 but i have a little doubt in my mind about how that would compare uh, on a on a cost basis with um the the uh, intensive uh, labor requirement perhaps than um, a large central factory with lots of machinery uh, designing and building prefabricated units uh, benefiting from an economy of scale could could a, a flying factory ever be economically uh, viable and competitive with that yeah so um the the idea was to um actually lower the up upfront costs to the to the developer so that smaller entities could actually take this this approach on um in terms of um in terms of whether the actual labor would be cheaper um I'm not entirely sure. I guess it depends on the locality of of the um, of the the factory. Um, I was thinking more sort of the the economy of scale. That if you're turning these things out in large numbers in a big factory, it's surely going to be cheaper in the long run than uh, doing small quantities locally. Yeah, and I think I think you can apply. You know, if, if someone wanted to take this design on, um, but have a have their own factory uh, because they they have the demand and they have the the investment they could definitely do that and re rec recoup their investment it was more about um sort of including 
other players in the market and start at small scale uh, as well as as large scale um and and so so there's there's kind of room for both but maybe yes yes absolutely definitely yeah yeah okay good (laughs) good so chris mcclory's got two questions one was about the finish and the other one was about the management of the trees I'll try. <laughs> Is she there, Chris? Um, sorry, I, I turned off. Uh, I oh, turned hi, Chris. My, um, my video, <laughs> sorry. Um, it's just, uh, I, I heard you say something about the finish of the walls when we've seen the inside. And I think, I don't know whether you said COT. I can't remember what it was. I just wondered what it meant anyway. Yes, yeah, sorry, CLT was the shorthand for L-T. cross-laminated, a cross-laminated cross-laminated timber which is so these sheets of um sheets of timber that are sort of either glued or pressed together um in at 90 degrees to each other in in laminated form oh thank you Um, and it makes a really strong um building material um and you and we yes part of our concept was to have some of that exposed so that you could see the natural material inside as well as as out um in some cases it would be uh, encased in um plasterboard if it's for example the um the escape route um to provide some um fire um what am i trying to say uh, <laughs> uh f- uh encapsulating it for fire um so that you've got a, a safe route to escape but actually our concept also had these um, misting sprinklers, um, which use an infra- infrared camera uh, on the wall, um, and it just diverts. Uh, a, it, it it scans the room, um, detects the the fire and the intensity of the fire, and produces a mist that goes directly to the to the. Um, the core of the fire so it uses a lot less water than a, a normal sprinkler would so with, you know without all the damage that you might um expect from a overhead sprinkler system thank you flo uh, you're welcome I, I thought it looked fab actually um, <laughs> my other question was about um the trees and um people would be fed up with me saying this i love the trees it looks <laughs> fantastic but um i'm always concerned about who's looking after them Yes. Um, yes, I think we need to um, we need to sort of have a plan, <laughs> you know. Um, and as a community, so a, a big part of the the context for this is that the community would um, would come together every so often and 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 manage. Uh, you know, if it wasn't or um, have some kind of management um, company as part of the the development. This is a very open, very open approach. Um, uh, I did, you know, lots of people can come together these days and and self build their own sort of community housing. Um, So they would already have a a, like a group that would meet and they'd have consensus and and tree management would be part of, of what you save up for um and and it's just it just becomes part of the fabric of the um of the of day-to-day life but um yes uh, i mean traditionally it's it's up to the council really to to manage but councils are squeezed um they don't have the resources um i guess we need to decide as a society whether we want to value um our environment and and um accept that they provide value as an ecosystem service you know um so those are all mega questions for for people to <laughs> to take on board thank you thank you you're welcome we've got a question from pauline handley um about uh what sort of glazing her house should have if she has new windows and i think <laughs> Pauline had another question about about uh, what was going to happen as a result of the competition. So can you unmute yourself, Pauline? I'm unmuted, I think. Yes, unmuted, definitely unmuted. 
Uh, can you hear me? Yes. Hi, Pauline. How are Hi, you? Hi, Flo. Hi, Flo. <laughs> I'm feeling warm and cozy watching your talk. It's oh, making good. Me... Congratulations. <laughs> Congratulations. I'll ask them in reverse order. Are you have any plans to have your houses built in you know, now you've come to this competition? Are you going to get them built? It's uh, well, there was a there was a plan to have a pilot built in the Sunderland Expo in 23, but um, the government couldn't plunge deep enough into their pockets. So only the two the two teams that actually won the final stage of the competition, uh, I think, get a, a chance to, to build those pilots. Um, so we're looking elsewhere, but um, at the moment we're developing um, a concept with a small Yorkshire uh, developer. Um, so there'll be a version of this probably um, more aligned to, um, to their cost model perhaps, um, but they still, they're still really keen to do beyond uh, net zero, for example, and use natural materials. Um, so yeah, we're really chuffed about that. Um, and then we're also trying to devise a sort of retro fit um, uh, version of the positive house, um, which is basically because people do build extensions, we felt if we could come up with a, a solution that was similar to this, just as an add on, but didn't increase um, people's impacts on um, in terms of carbon emissions, both in embodied carbon and um, operational carbon, then that would be something that people might be interested in as well. So yeah, watch the space. <laughs> Sounds like it'll be very popular. Can I just briefly slip in a question? You just mentioned at the beginning you use triple glazing. Yes. And I'm, I'm wondering if for any ordinary house that you're doing retrofitting on, and I have a personal interest in this, <laughs> what are the pros and cons of triple and double glazing for an ordinary house when it's being retrofitted? Yeah, um, it's a good question, Pauline, um, because sometimes you kind of look at the rest of the house and whether it's you know really worth it and are you going to get um all the conditions of a, a passive house and and the answer is probably not but um triple glazing gives you um what it means is it gives you a much higher internal surface temperatures um throughout the year so uh, you don't get that sort of either the downdraft from the window which is it's it's not necessarily a draft coming through the window it's just the air cooling by the window and then dumping on on the floor and that causes a draft um it also means the temperatures are usually above 16 degrees so you don't get the mold um growing on on frames that kind of thing um so and then there's the acoustic benefit so if you have um if you're on a busy road for example or you you know you just like uh, you like the peace and quiet. You can shut your windows, and you will literally not hear anything. Um, and if you've got the ventilation alongside that, um, it's it's just a really comfortable space uh, to be in compared to to any other space. Um, I had yeah, yeah they were very heavy. Are they not very heavy and provide? challenges for the the any normal window and then um, do they alter the light coming through because they're much thicker um so yes and yes <laughs> um but it's still possible and um, so the the way so we're going to do this on our house so i'm hoping to do a bit of a case study anyway but um the way they're going to do it in our house is uh build ply boxes um so that we can actually position the window in the insulation layer outside um, but the structure uh, has been you know it's it's a cavity wall so the structure is the structure can take it take the weight um, and then what was the other thing you said uh, um, alters the light the quality of the light, the light. yes so um, we try to uh, specify a, a high uh, light um, factor. So um, 
And the reason for this is that, that the windows also help with the uh, solar gains in the winter. Um, so you get more light, more, um, more gains. You, you can get a lot more light through a double glazed unit, um, but I, I'm not sure it's that noticeable when you go from this sort of standard double glazing to right. um, Thanks very uh, much. a well-specified triple glazed unit. Uh, okay. on the same subject. Sorry? Can I ask a question on the same subject? Of, of course. I think that's Be Beverly, I think. Oh, okay. Um, I've got, we've, got, we've, got, uh, um, we've got quite a few questions coming in. So um, Beverly, if you want to ask your question and then we'll move on to Ashley, because he's got a question about retrofit as well. <laughs> uh, yes, it was a simple one, uh, since uh, uh, Dr. Gladen was raised. Someone was telling me, I mean, I've got old double glazing, that uh, the uh, double glazing with argon fills in it are much more efficient. Is that true? Um, yes, I'd say um, most modern double glazing has argon uh, in it. Yeah. Uh, so for the efficiency. <laughs> and Ashley, do you want to ask your question about retrofit? Oh, that'd be great. Thanks, Pippa. Yeah. Hello, Florence. Hi. Hi, Ashley. Hi. I was interested to uh, hear that you were saying 80% of housing um, in 2050 has already been built. Yes. So that obviously means each of us were sat in our houses have got quite a bit to do to achieve this target. Okay. Is, it, is, is there a view of how far each of us have to go? Is it just a case of getting the insulation better? triple glazing and a heat pump and you're there or is it that we've got to go much further than that to achieve that sort of thing um so yeah i unfortunately with retrofit it's it is quite messy and there isn't a one size fits all and the the way we approach it with the carbon co-op in manchester um who i'm a retrofit assessor for um is we would come to your house and do a survey and um we can give you you can give us an idea of um your budget um your time frames uh whether you can live with some disruption or not um, and we can come up with certain scenarios um two or three scenarios of how you could go about uh, and how deep your retrofit we call it deep retrofit <laughs> um, so the the passive house standard for retrofit is called Enerfit, and it's got a slightly higher uh, target for energy which is 25 kilowatt hours per square meter per year um based on the fact that you can't really get the air tightness as far down as a, a new build passive house um and also some of the thermal bridging can be uh, challenging um, but, you know, uh, some people are in conservation areas or um, they have, uh, there are strict rules about um, how much they can do to their house. So you revert to uh, internal insulation, which is, which you can't really go, you can't really push as far. So, um, yeah, unfortunately, every house is different. Um, and, but generally speaking, yes, insulation, air tightness um heat pump if you can if you can get to it but I, I really would uh try and reduce the demand of the house before you you, you get your heat pump um so and there's is a it, lot of space. Sorry. <laughs> thank you and is it realistic to think that 80 percent of the housing stock can actually achieve the the sort of the energy efficiency that's needed um there is there are a few organizations that have come up with um you know some solid plans to retrofit our existing housing um but it will take a lot of political will um so um realistic in a technical sense absolutely um on a political level it's it's hard to see how that's that's going to um come to fruition but we stay positive, we do what we can. <laughs> um, and yeah, bit by bit, I think. <laughs> and, and I'll just put in a plug for Andrew, who's looking for people to have um, free transition rooms, low energy surveys. So do let us know if you want to. Have oh, yes, yes. Um, I forgot about that. I do that as well. <laughs> Don't Andrew um, do that, so. 
Yeah. Oh, and um, and actually, the MacTastic are putting on a Q and A next Wednesday, which I'm part of the panel for, and this is all about retrofit. So, um, if you want more details about that, I can circulate the details. Great. We've got lots more questions. So um, Holly has got a question about government building regulations. Hi. Um, so you said at the start, like developers will only build more sustainably if the government requires it. Um, do you think that government building regulations are the best way to tackle the climate crisis? And do you think that the government will actually implement enough of them to meet the climate targets? Wow, yes, great question. Um, so the future home standard, which was consulted on last year and has come out, um, the first version was definitely too little and far too late. And then with some, um, with some pushback from uh, designers in the industry and, and things like that, they opted for the a uh, slightly higher target, <laughs> which was still too little, too late. So, um, and then the timescale for implementing the future home standard is pretty poor. Um, so no, I don't think government uh, legislation alone is going, to, is going to get us where we need to go. Luckily, a lot of, there are, you know, movements and there's the Good Homes Alliance and there, you know, there are people trying to move the industry on anyway. Um, so we'll, we're just going to try and, um, and go with that really as much as we can. Uh, but yeah, political will so far has been pretty, um, pretty lame. <laughs> Does that answer your question? Yeah. Yeah, thank yeah. you. You're welcome. Okay, so, so Jeff Levermore's got a question about the difference between passive house and positive house. Do you want to ask your question, Jeff? Yeah, oh, thanks, Flo. It's, uh, it's really good to see your presentation. You're using <laughs> cross laminated timber. I, I'm surprised the RICS uh, only lasts 60 years. It's really good material. You can build very big buildings with that. Yes, you I was can, just yeah. wondering that, um, you know, with uh, the difference between this and passive house, and also, you know, how are you going to deal with those problems of summer overheating, which so many of these new buildings do have? Yeah, yeah. Um, so Positive House is just our design, um, but it follows, um, it meets the Passive House standard, which is a, a, a standard that came out of Germany um, a few decades ago. Um, and it was originally um, just based on home. So the home... Uh, aspects and proposition is very uh, well known and um, you can apply it to um, to housing really easily with some simple simple rules um, but it's also been extended to other buildings so there's passive house you can apply passive house to non non domestic buildings um, it's been a bit slow on the uptake uh, or it has, it has historically, uh, but there's quite a, a bit of a snowball movement at the moment. And a lot of councils now are, are requesting that as um, for their own social housing um, in competitions and things like that. So that's what I'm um, hoping for. Um, and then- so You're to the full standard of passive house, are you, Flo? Yes. Well, yeah. uh, the, the thing about passive house is you don't actually get the certification until you've gone through the whole process. So that's the other reason why um, I kind of back, back this particular standard is that it's got a quite, it's got, it has a rigorous sort of quality uh, assurance process. Um, and you have to demonstrate that you've done certain things that you've molded it in a certain way. They have um, third party certifiers that will check your, uh, your model. Um, and that's what, um, reduces the sort of what we call the performance gap. So designers have been designing eco homes and uh, low energy buildings for years, um, uh, but they've been really surprised by the results, either because of behaviour, um, you know, operational behaviour, or but more generally, it's the sort of construction standard, the construction quality on site. So that's 
cause this sort of um, this slip or the gap between what we expected the building to do and what the building actually does. Um, so yeah, so passive houses are our best chance of, of closing that gap. Um, uh, yeah. But then passive house has its own several classes, so you can have passive house plus and premium. So if you if you have loads of PV and generation on your roof, you can end up with a higher class of passive house. But what about the summer overheating that quite a few of them suffer from? Yes, yeah, so summer overheating, I think uh, it's um, it's a shame that some of the early early um, examples of passive house, um, they they did have a summer overheating criteria, but it was pretty um, it was pretty crude and um, and and so you could pass with um, not very much thought, unfortunately, to that particular aspect, but actually, uh, the key to summer overheating, especially in this country, is just uh, making the windows uh, appropriate in size to the orientation of those windows. Um, we also have to get we also have to get comfortable with external shading. You know, on the continent, this is shutters are pretty normal, <laughs> um, and there's a reason for that, and that's to to take you know to keep the sun out when you don't um, you don't want it in. Uh, creating heat inside and then um, and then having thermal mass helps obviously and um, so some of the lightweights off-site manufacture sort of steel steel structures um, with infill panels are pretty um, will perform pretty poorly um, and general if you just built a house to um, building regulations up until now, there hasn't really been uh, any onus on the designers to do anything particular about um, summer overheating. So um, highly insulated houses, which aren't as insulated as passive houses, but are more insulated than they have been. Uh, but no, no, no sort of mechanical ventilation apart from the extract from your, your bathroom. Um, those are those are overheating because because of um, the way they've been designed, really. And, yeah, and people don't yeah. change the filter, so they don't work very well. <laughs> What's that? Sorry, they just can't win. They no, the the uh, mechanical MVHR often well, doesn't work yes, because I people mean, don't realise there's a filter that needs changing. They get certainly. a very low ventilation rate. You can't open your windows, and you no, get you, no. You can open your window. You have to. You have to be oh, able to. You open can your fully window. open the windows. Oh yes, absolutely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh well, that's uh, good. It's, um, it's definitely part of the strategy. I, I'm just. I'm just aware of the time. Um, um, yes. So, oh, okay. Thanks, um, Rob. No worries, Jeff. <laughs> um, uh, um, Rob. Oh, Helen says, uh, Flo, could you finish screen sharing so she can see bigger pictures? Oh, sorry. Yeah. Yes, of course. Um, and Rob Sharp had a question. Uh, thank you, Pippa. Um, Flo, what, what economic constraints, if any, were placed on the competitors and uh, was it expressed in life cycle um, cost terms? Um, uh, that's, that's a really good question. No, we weren't given any economic um, parameters as such. Um, and we did feel um, they could have provided some commercial input really um having said that we did um we did i'm, I'm sorry i'm sorry helen i'm going to share my screen again um, <laughs> um i'm just going to show one slide which shows uh, a value approach uh, as opposed to a cost approach um which was how we sort of um justified um what might be seen as additional cost, but actually when you start to look at it in terms of cost to society, you know, someone's got to pay for um, bad health and um, and certain out certain bad outcomes. We all pay for it either through um, through suffering or lack of, you know, through our taxes. So um, we either recognise it in, in as part of our um, our housing uh, offering. Um, and we recognise the value and where that value comes from, you know, where that additional funding comes from, we've got to be get creative about um, 
it might be pension funds need to invest in um, in sustainable housing, you know, as a future future proof um, solution. We need to find a, a financing model that works. We felt our approach was a low cost way of building, but we didn't have the benefits of a developer or a, an offsite, you know, a large scale offsite manufacturer to to give us that. Um, um, uh, that input. Um, so, for example, um, savings to the NHS because people um, live in drafty, mouldy, mouldy uh, houses, um, and therefore have um, conditions that then have to be treated. That that can be monetized, and the, the you know the government have ways of, of monetizing that. Um, if we had a proper carbon cost, uh, you could factor that in. Um, at the moment, you know, you can offset carbon for a few pounds per kilogram, which is completely ridiculous. Um, when, you know, some of the think tanks have said we should be paying about 100 to 150 pounds per, um, did I say kilo or ton? I can't remember. <laughs> it's, hard to, it's getting late. Um, so um, that's more the sort of level that we should be looking at it. But even looking, you know, even if you apply today's sort of carbon trading um, cost, we felt uh, we could justify some of the additional costs on that basis. Um, and then there's the savings on energy bills, which can be quantified up front. So, um, yes, this was our... Um, this was our sort of gut feel, as it were. <laughs> Thanks, Flo. I'm sure, you're winning, I'm sure you win in cost in use terms, but in capital cost terms, do you think you're in the order of, I don't know, plus 10, 20, whatever percent on current costs? So we applied Nottingham and sort of normal uh, site costs, and we were, we were ending up at about 2,200 per square metre. Right. So 220 per square foot, I think. Um, right. So the semi would have cost, I think, in the region of 300 and something thousand pounds. Um, so, yes, it's not what you would call um, affordable housing, perhaps, uh, at this stage, but again with um, innovative funding models and financing models um, there's no reason why we can't um, do this kind of housing um, where it's needed. Right, thank you. <laughs> You're welcome. Um, I'm going to bring the questions to an end now because it's it's nine o'clock. There are still some other very interesting questions up there. Is it is it possible, Flo, for people to have your email address or contact you through your Humblebee website if they totally? Want to... <laughs> <laughs> Here's a slide I prepared earlier. Um, no, um, absolutely. Fire crest questions, and even you know, if you don't manage uh, to get hold of me, do do send. Um, send them to transition or um, yeah lovely thank you uh, well welcome. thank you so much for answering all those questions Flo and I'll hand back to Lata fabulous I'll and stop sharing stop sharing yeah yeah thank you Pippa I'm gonna hand over to Vince who wants to say a few words yeah just to uh to thank Flo for what's obviously been a very informative and interesting talk. We could tell that from the vast number of questions that we ran out of time to answer there. And the quality of the questions, obviously it has generated a great deal of interest. A few of the things that I noted as we went through, which uh, hadn't occurred to me, but if you think 80% of buildings in 2050 are already built, as Ashley pointed out, uh, comment there, uh, that's obviously true. If we look at the houses that we all live in now, how long they've been here and how long we expect them still to be here, that's something that uh, we've got to look at. And uh, having an age an age friendly community yeah. to, certainly appealed to me at my <laughs> high stage of life. <laughs> That's great. Um, interesting, the, the sort of designs that we looked at for the layout of the buildings with the vehicles kept to the uh, periphery um, to make cycling and, uh, and walking safe, practical and uh, more desirable as well. 
Um, this obviously is is not new. The Netherlands is, has, has led the way here, probably, in designing yeah. Yeah. towns like this. Uh, and that didn't happen. That, ha that hasn't always been the case. The Netherlands had some terrible road conditions until they realised they had to do something about it. Uh, and then they got their act together and, uh, and did something about it. Uh, and I know at one point in, in my working life, I, I spent a bit of time in, in Denmark. And I was amazed to see there the cycling uh, facilities, and the, the yeah. in-town cycleways, and the fact that when you're sitting in the hotel in the morning having your breakfast, you don't have streams of cars going past, you have streams of bicycles going past. And this was an eye-opener to me, because I didn't realise other countries were like this, but they are. Mm. Fascinating. Uh, mm. UK forestry, 13% compared to the European average of 38%. That's frightening, yeah. isn't it? Yeah, really? yeah, yeah, totally. Uh, yeah. That was an eye-opener to me. Um, Too many sheep. <laughs> Yes, <laughs> get to use that wall. And the house <laughs> extensions in Wilmslow, crikey, it's, it's uh, white band central in Wilmslow, isn't it? It's no sooner as one extension finished and another one starts, every road's full of, full of white vans. But interesting, the point about recycling timber uh, at the end of life of these buildings, um, there's nothing new in that either, because um, uh, as, as many people here know, I, I volunteer with the National Trust at Nether Oldie Mill, and the timber in that building has been carbon dated to be far older than the mill itself. So it's come from other sources, yeah. from barns, some of it even, they reckon, from, from uh, naval ships. Where they've been oh, wow, amazing, yeah. Re reusing the timber. Anyway, I can't pretend to have understood everything you said, but I certainly got the gist of it, and it really was fascinating. I'm looking at what's going on in Glasgow. I guess we'll have to get the politicians to uh, put their money where their mouth is, or probably our money where their mouth is, <laughs> and uh, enable these fantastic ideas to happen. So thank you very much indeed for that. Oh, you're very welcome. Thanks, Vince. It was a pleasure. <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll hand back to I think I'm only back to Stuart now, aren't I? Um, it's to m myself, Stuart. Oh, yourself, Hector, right. Yeah. So can I just ask oh. everyone to unmute themselves and give Flo a big round of applause. <laughs> Thank you very much, Flo. You're, really you're good. very welcome. Okay, and everyone should have some contact details. Back. If you have got any questions and Flo, thank you very much once again. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. Brilliant. All right, everyone. Thank you, everybody. Thank I'm you. going to stop the shit recording now. Thank you. Bye-bye.